The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode.
Hello. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Now. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for the technical issues. I am here now. My name is Pooja, and I am an expert for today. I would like to welcome each one of you, and I would like to thank you for taking out the time from your busy schedule say your leisurely weekends to attend this webinar. I would also like to take this up to thank Credula, uh, India's first dedicated education loan company who has been helping Indian students go abroad and realize their dream of overseas education. So welcome everybody. I hope that this webinar is able to help you in answering certain questions which you might about overseas education. So starting with my uh, presentation, the topics I'm going to cover today in this webinar are why would any student want to go study abroad? What do universities abroad look at? What are the education systems abroad like? Factors to look at while selecting a school? Funding overseas education? how and when to apply. I would be taking questions at the end of the webinar, so please please be ready with your questions if you have any, and I shall address them. So moving on with my presentation, um, all of you who are here present today attending this webinar, in some way or the other, have already decided or, uh, or have at least thought about education. So I really, really hope that whatever information I am going to share in this webinar will be able to help you to decide whether your dream or whether your decision or whether your thought of going abroad for your higher education is viable or not. And I'm sure this presentation will change a lot of your perceptions about overseas education. So moving I would like to first start my webinar with certain facts which uh, might be really, really interesting to you. Note, um, in 1975, as, as much as 8 lakh students from 34 countries went abroad to study. Yes, it might look like a very huge number, but in 2008, this number quadrupled to over 3.3 million students, which is a huge, huge number. And this was just an 11% increase over the prior year. So you can just imagine how many students must be going every year to realize the dream of studying abroad. You also might be interested in noting that Harvard has graduated a total of eight U.S. presidents more than any university, which is a phenomenon in itself. Harvard is something which each and every education abroad aspirant is familiar, at, familiar with and dreams of studying at. So, why do people really, really opt for higher education? Why not stay in your own country and study where you are, you are getting the same programs abroad as well? So the basic, the first thing which comes to my mind and any student's mind would be, what would be the economic value of an higher education if I go abroad? Of course, uh, this is one of the major, major factors. And as you can see from the slide that if you've done a bachelor's degree or an a master's degree from abroad, the kind of salary graph or the kind of compensation graph um, your career will take. So this is just to give you an overview that, you know, the economic value of an higher education is really, really high, be it anywhere. So why do Indians specifically go abroad and study? There are a whole load of factors which are involved in this. Of course, um, 
emphasis on practical learning. The very thing which an Indian education system misses out to a great extent, emphasis on practical learning. Schools abroad, whether it's an undergraduate program, whether it is a master's program, whether it is an MBA program, each school in each of the countries make sure that each of their students get as much practical learning in the program as possible, whether through internships, whether through projects, whether through company-related consultancy projects. They make sure that each and every student of theirs, whatever they have studied, they are able to put it into practice in real life and see what they have studied. The second thing being academic excellence in all fields whether it is a research-based program, whether it is a thought-based program, whether it is a thesis-based program. Uh, countries, countries or I should say education systems abroad have excellence in each and every field. Another thing which you will definitely gain out of an overseas education will be the global exposure. Think about a class in which you are sitting with more than 50 nationalities. You might just be the only the second or the third Indian in a particular group or in a particular tree, team or in a class. Because universities abroad boast of a very, very high diversity where students from as many as 50 nationalities sit in one class and study. Then cutting-edge technology and research, of course, the kind of technological advancements which have come in the world definitely go to developed countries. Campus life, the kind of campuses which these universities are, have are huge. The kind of facilities they give you to help you study, to help you recreate, to help you get involved in not just studies but activities outside of classroom. They have huge, huge campuses. They understand the needs of their student because a student is not just expected to study abroad but is expected to get involved in each and every activity which the school organizes. Well, well, I should say not the school, but their own children organize. Attractive compensation, of course, the kind of job opportunities which are, which come your way when you are abroad, be it USA, be it UK, Europe, be it Singapore. The kind of job opportunities you get abroad is definitely higher in terms of the kind of compensation you're going to get with those jobs. So these are some of the factors why any any student, not just Indian, but any student would want to go from one country to the other country for their education. Um, in this slide, I would, I would like to cover certain popular destinations for each of the students. Um, as you can see, Singapore, USA, UK Europe, Australia and Canada are among the most popular destinations where any Indian student would like to go and study. Um, each of these countries differ in terms of a lot of factors. As you can see, USA heads the, um, you know, the academic excellence part, which is, and it is closely followed by Canada and Singapore. USA is a major, major leader in education, edu uh, educational developments, any technological developments. USA is a country which pays a lot of attention to the kind of students they graduate and the kind of education their students are getting. It is very closely followed by Canada, which also takes off from a U.S. education system, followed by U.K. Europe, specifically countries like Germany, which has come up as a hotspot for students going for, let's say, automobile engineering. So these countries have really, really come up where international students are found in huge numbers. 
as far as career prospects are concerned of course jobs are very very important you you would be investing a huge amount of not just money but your time and your effort so the kind of career prospects which a country gives you after the completion of your program is of also utmost importance so as you can see from the slide as far as career opportunities are concerned again USA Singapore and Canada lead the pack UK and European countries have taken a back seat because of the the regulations which have come into effect so as you can see the next one which covers visa regulations again Singapore is Singapore and Canada are two of the most flexible countries which really really take care of their international students even after the program has gotten over and it is very closely followed by USA and Australia and now once you have gone to the decision to go abroad and study of course is a combination of a lot of factors and one of the most important being costs so as you can see slide I'm sorry uh, again USA UK Europe Australia and Canada are all um, you know are all all on the costly side but as far as Singapore is concerned you have you your cost will be significantly lower because of the Asia Asia Pacific connection as far as now you must be wondering that too how do you reduce these costs which you would incur in while studying at a school as you can see USA being thought about as the most expensive country again also has a lot of scholarship programs it really really looks out for it in for its international students that they can come and study in their country so you can see that USA UK Europe and Canada lead the pack wherein they offer really really good amounts of scholarship and are closely followed by Singapore and Australia not so much Singapore because Singapore is not very expensive it would be very very similar to India so <clears throat> sorry you have gotten to know about the popular destinations now I'm sure a lot of you must be familiar with top universities also for example Stanford University of Pennsylvania Harvard California Institute of Technology Cambridge University College London Massachusetts Institute of Technology you can see from the pictures the kind of campuses they have the kind of facilities they might be having in these campuses just to maintain these campuses a huge amount of money is invested by these universities is given to them in donation by their alumni so that they can take their mission of imparting education you can see the kind of fabulous uh, campus building Columbia has, Princeton for that matter, and Oxford, University of Chicago, Brown University, and Yale. All of them have phenomenal campuses and phenomenal uh, facilities. So now that you've seen that these are the top universities, you must be wondering that what do I have to do exactly to get into each of these universities what do I do what do these universities basically look at what do they expect out of me these are some of the common things which a university looks at from an, from an applicant first is your standardized tests anything whether you're going for an MBA program whether you're going for a master's program whether you're going for a bachelor's degree program or a PhD for that matter standardized tests definitely give an idea of the kind of applicant you will be to a school and these scores are the only thing which you can change in your overall profile when you decide to apply abroad change your academic performance you cannot change the kind of work you might be doing or the, you cannot change the kind of activities you might be involved in but to give an edge to your profile the only thing which you can change is by performing well in these tests these tests are universal tests they are that's why they are called standardized tests 
no matter which country you take them from, the format will be the same. That's the reason why they are referred to as standardized tests. So most of the universities use these standardized tests to uh, compare applicants from all around the globe because they get applications from all around the globe. Now, for example, India has a different education system from, let's say, Singapore. So how do they compare an applicant coming from India or coming from Singapore? Standardized tests are the ones which give them an Second thing is work experience. In specifically in programs like MBA, uh, programs like PhD in management related subjects, the quality and quantity of your work experience is very, very important. Quantity, any school abroad would require you to have at least two to three years of work experience. An MBA system is very, very different uh, from what it is in India. The MBA programs abroad are specifically designed for people who have some kind of work experience so that whatever they have learned from their experience of working in a team structure, in a corporate structure, they can utilize that to gain maximum exposure in their MBA program. Hence, the work experience is one of the most important criterions which can really, really set you apart from any other applying from the for the same program. Extracurricular activities. Yes, um, you must have heard people say as long as your tests are okay, as long as your academic performance is very, very good, uh, you have chances of getting to a school. I wouldn't deny that. But ECAs also form a very, very important part of your application. It shows to the admissions committee that you are equally involved not just in your studies or your work but you do things apart from your work as well whether whether it be a hobby which you have taken up or you are interested in giving back to the society and you are involved in community service NGO work you like to teach underprivileged children you like to teach tennis to students that is something which again sets you apart from other people for example who might have the same who might have similar kind of work experience so this is the this is the thing which gives an overall picture about your personality to a school academics yes you must be wondering that do universities abroad only look for toppers or Studying abroad is only, is only made for people who are toppers. Definitely not. What, not everybody can be a topper. Of course, if you are one, it definitely sets you apart. But if you are not, it doesn't mean that you cannot go and study. Definitely you can. What is very, very important is consistency and stability in your academics. You have to maintain your performance throughout. Even if you couldn't in one semester or one year, universities abroad give you that kind of space where you can explain why did you, why did you not perform in a particular semester or a particular year. But please keep in mind that what they really, really look at is stability in your academics. Very high and very low percentages are something which they really don't look at. They look at all your four years of um, economic performance and whether it has been consistent or not. Your essays and your letters of reference again are something which a university very very critically scrutinizes because essays are basically a true reflection of your potential. Yes, a lot of students do say or a lot of people do say that what are essays? They are just passages written in good English. If you know how to write flowery English you can get through any school. You can write very good essays. I would like to beg to differ because essays are not just passages written in good English, but essays are something which bring out your personality, which bring out your strengths and hide your weaknesses. They tell an admissions committee your 20, 25 years of your life, how have you spent it? What have you really, really done to set apart yourself from other people?
Hence, they are very, very important. Letters of reference, of course, are a third party opinion about your abilities and capabilities. For example, your professor or your supervisor at work, they would let the school know what kind of abilities or what kind of capabilities you have shown at your workplace or for example students who might not have had really good grades but have done phenomenally well at their workplace. LORs are something which the schools will very very closely scrutinize to understand whether the not so great academic performance does not really you know justify the students capability. Uh, research work and papers. Students who are interested in PhD programs and doing research in universities abroad have to keep in mind that universities really, really look for any kind of research experience you might have had in the in the field you are interested in pursuing your PhD. It is very, very important. If you have written any papers or co-written any papers with any of the faculty members or your professors or your fellow students, definitely add to your profile. Now, there are different types of universities abroad. Just to classify them very, very simply, one is a large university, which can be, let's say, a state university, which has thousands of students. And there could be a small university, which might be a private or a state university again. So it, this pie chart basically helps you see what are the things um, these particular universities give more importance to. As you can see, a large university scores are more important to them. They will use, uh, use it as a differentiating factor, uh, differentiating factor um, as from one application to the other. The GPA or your academic performance is as important as your scores and your personals, which includes your work experience, your application, your essays, your extracurricular activities, is given a little less preference. As far as small universities is concerned, your personals, which are, again, your work experience, your application, your extracurricular activities, are given more importance, whereas your scores and your grade point average, which is your academic performance, is taken on the same platform. So you can very well see from this how different universities focus on different things. There is no one set thing which you can say that, okay, if I have a very, very high score, I will get through university. No, you have to focus yourself and market yourself as a package. Now, I would like to cover a little bit about the education systems which are prevalent abroad. Now, there are different levels of education uh, abroad as they are like in India as well. The terminology might be a little different. For example, um, an Indian bachelor's or a bachelor's degree, which is called a bachelor's degree in India, would be referred to as an undergraduate degree abroad, whether you go to USA, whether you go to United States, whether you go to Germany, whether you go to Singapore. Everywhere, most of the bachelor's degrees are referred to as undergraduate degrees. Whereas, Indian postgraduate level courses, for example, a postgraduate diploma, a postgraduate degree, all these are termed as graduate level studies abroad wherein master's and PhD degrees make up the graduate level programs abroad. At the same time, an, in, uh, an MBA program abroad is equivalent to what an Indian MBA might be. They do not have a system of giving a postgraduate degree or a postgraduate diploma in management like certain universities like IIMs and ISB give in India. They just give an MBA degree. Now, now that we have understood what are the different levels of degrees which universities abroad have, um, as you can see from the slide, the duration of each of these programs is very, very different in each of these countries. As you can see, an undergraduate degree in USA is for four years. 
any program you do at the bachelor's level in USA will invariably be of four years. Whereas in United Kingdom or European countries, their average of uh, bachelor's level education is three years. Some engineering courses might be of four years. Again, Singapore, Canada, and Australia, most of their degrees are for three years, but certain courses like bachelors in engineering or bachelors in science might go up to four years. So it can be anywhere from three to four years in duration. Now we come to master's or PhD program. As you can see again from this graph that in USA, master's programs are invariably for two years. There is no variable duration here. Whereas a PhD program in USA can stretch anywhere from three to five years, the minimum being three. As far as UK European countries are concerned, masters in UK European countries are for one year. And um, their PhD programs, again, are from three to five years. Um, for Singapore and Australia, again, the master's programs are for anywhere from one to two years. It can be for one year, it can be for 15 months, or it could be for two years, depending on the subject you are going to study. And as you can see, PhD program across all these countries are invariably from three to five years in duration. MBA programs. As you can see again from this graph that USA, the, the duration of most of the programs in USA are fixed. For example, as you can see, the MBA program in USA is for two years. Whereas in UK European countries, it is for one year. They have duration programs. Canada and Australia are on similar platforms where their program ranges anywhere from 1 to 1.5 years. But most of them do not go up to 2 years. Whereas Singapore programs are still up to 1.5, which is 12 to 15 months in duration. Now, these were some things which are prevalent and where Indian students generally go for, or the kind of degrees Indian students generally uh, pursue abroad. Now, you must be wondering that what is the kind of background they require for each of these programs, or what is whether my three-year degree, I am done, I've done a bachelor's in economics, or I've done a bachelor's in commerce. Am I eligible to apply to any countries? Or I've done my bachelor's in engineering, or bachelor's in technology. Am I eligible to study in all these universities? I hope this slide dispels and covers a lot of information. Um, USA, as I shared a little earlier, that in USA, bachelor's degrees are for four years. Since their own bachelor's degree are for four years, they generally expect other country students also to come in with them with a four-year degree. But as opposed to popular misconception that USA only, only takes four, year, four years of, or I should say a four-year degree, well, they do take three-year degrees as well. But the options which a student might get with a three-year degree will definitely be lower than what a student can get with a four-year undergraduate degree. UK three-year bachelor's degrees are accept accepted as everybody knows that our education system takes away from the United Kingdom uh, system. So in, U in uh, UK and European countries, uh, three-year bachelor's degrees are accepted. Um, the only exception being Germany, where four-year degrees are only accepted, just like USA. Um, Canada, Australia, and Singapore. Again, Australia and Singapore, three-year bachelor's degrees are accepted, whether it is in commerce, whether it is in science, whether it is in social science. They do accept a three-year bachelor's degree.
the only exception country out of all these countries in terms of required economic background is Canada. Canada only and only takes a four-year bachelor's specifically from India. And this four-year degree has to be, for example, an engineering degree or a continuous four-year degree. The only other qualification which they accept other than a four-year engineering degree is a BCom plus chartered accountancy, which they feel is equivalent to a four-year continuous degree. Now, now that you have got to know how many years each of these degrees take and what universities look at, and tests being one of the major factors, um, I would like to also cover what countries require what kind of tests. Now, for those of you students who are interested in going for bachelor's degree abroad, as you can see from this graph that USA is one of the only countries which mandatorily requires a SAT score, SAT or ACT, so and along with TOEFL. Um, since USA is, uh, since USA requires students coming from abroad should have had their undergraduate degrees or their schooling done in English. Even if you have, some of the universities would ask you for a TOEFL score so that they can ascertain whether you will be able to survive in U.S. schools where English is the primary language. So as you can see from other countries, uh, most of them only require IELTS or TOEFL as a score and mandatorily might not require SAT. Only exceptions being the top schools in UK, for example, University of London, Oxford and Cambridge are the only exceptions as well as London School of Economics which might require SAT for their undergraduate program. Um, Canada again SAT is preferred but is not mandatory as is for Australia as well as Singapore. Masters. Um, as again you can see USA is one of the countries which is very very focused on the test scores. So for masters again if you are planning to go to USA for doing your masters you have to understand that GRE is a very very important aspect for the masters programs in United States. So along with the GRE score they would also ask you for a TOEFL. Now as far as other countries are concerned as you can see most of them are okay with an IELTS score. Again, certain universities in UK, for example, Oxford, Cambridge, London School of Economics, and um, University of London might, might require you to take your GRE for certain subjects. Um, Canada, again, GRE is preferred but is not mandatory. Singapore, again, um, for Singapore, GRE is only required for certain programs and not for all. MBA program is a little different from masters and undergraduate as you can see from the test requirements. Almost all the countries will require you to have a GMAT score. Almost all of them. There are certain countries like um, UK or um, Australia where you might get certain scores which might not require you to have a GMAT score. Now, what should you look at while selecting a school? The class profile. It is very, very important to look at the kind of class a university has or the particular program has, whether you fit into their class as far as the credentials are concerned, uh, whether it's the GMAT, GRE, or the SAT, average SAT scores, whether it's the average work, anything. The second thing and most important thing is study methodology. Now, you might not be comfortable with the curriculum of certain schools. If you're looking at a particular focus area, for example, in your master's, you're looking for something like computer networks. 
every university might not be in a position to give it to you no matter how reputed. So the first thing you need to look at is whether the curriculum suits your whether the focus areas you are interested in, the school has those. The faculty. You also have to look at the kind of faculty a school has. How many of their faculty have received the Nobel Prizes? How many of their faculty are distinguished professors or chairs in their own schools or some other schools? You really, really have to look at the kind of faculty, uh, the kind of faculty a school has, whether they are experienced practitioners, experience what is the kind of research they do rankings and placements it's very important again yes rankings is not the only criterion but is one of the most important criterions look at the kind of rankings a school enjoys for that particular specialization or that particular area look at the kind of placement opportunities look at the kind of companies which come to that particular school to um, hire students. Uh, what has their placement record been for the last two, three years? It's very, very important that you focus on that as well because you will be investing a huge amount of money and return on investment is one of the criterions. Um, location. Again, where is the school located? Whether it's in New York, it's in Boston, whether it's in California, the Silicon Valley, you have to look at the location also because each of these locations have different kind of advantages to them. Then finally, the kind of research centers they have. What is the kind of research which is going on in these schools? Whether are they, are they updating their curriculum every year? You also have to look at that. Now, one of the most important factors for any international student is how much is the cost structure or how much do I have to spend for these programs as you can see from the slide USA is is deemed to be one of the most expensive uh, countries to study in as you can see their undergraduate and the master's courses can cost you anywhere from 15 to 20 or 20 lakhs per annum since US programs are Typically, especially masters and MBA are typically for two years and undergrad for four years. So these are the cost structure for per annum every year. MBA can cost you anywhere from 25 to 45 lakhs per annum. But you also have to understand that tuition is a function of duration, location, and courses. Your living expenses in New York might be definitely higher than a school which is located in Indiana. So you have to look at the kind of living expenses you will be incurring in a particular place. UK Europe again, undergraduate costs you anywhere from 15 to 20 lakhs and considering it is a three-year program. Masters, 15 to 25 lakhs for the entire program since it's a, it is a one-year program anywhere from 25 to 45 lakhs depending on the university for the whole Canada in terms of costs is very very similar to USA since you must be knowing that Canadian dollar has in fact risen up more than US dollars so undergraduate can cost you anywhere from 15 to 20 lakhs and there are for three to four years again these costs are for per year Masters also can cost you anywhere from 15 to 25 lakhs. MBA, 15, depending on the duration of the program. Australia undergraduate, again, 20 to 25 lakhs, considering they have a three to four year undergraduate degree. Masters can be anywhere from 11 to 20 lakhs, depending on the duration, since, again, their programs can be anywhere from 1 to 1.5 years. MBA is again 20 to 35 lakhs depending on the duration of the program. Last but not the least, Singapore. Singapore is one of um, on the cheaper side of the countries if you are looking at a quality education but also a little on the cheaper side. So undergraduate can cost you anywhere from 10 to 15 lakhs. Masters is 10 to, again, 10 to 15 lakhs. MBA is 25 to 35 lakhs. Now, financial aid is very, very 
every international student is concerned about financial aid. These are the different kinds of um, help which a university can give to a student. Graduate assistantship where you could be a teaching assistant in the school, where you could be a research assistant to a professor. All of these you would get a stipend every semester. Then other, other um, forms of scholarships are your fellowships offered by universities. They, which are based on merit and financial need. Then again, scholarships and fellowships offered by external organizations like TOEFL, ETS has come up with a TOEFL scholarship. Help students who are going abroad for their education, gives them a huge amount of money for the entire duration of the program. Then uh, places like Tata Endowment Fund or Tata Trust, they also give um, interesting loans to students who are going abroad. And last but not the least, Cradilla again, uh, which really, really helps Indian students in attaining a higher amount of education loan and they make sure that the process is faster. So understood what is the what is the duration of the program how much does it does it cost factors to look at while selecting the university um, each of you must be wondering that what are the steps involved in um, actually applying abroad so the first and the most important factor is mapping your profile to the right university a Harvard is very very different from a Stanford or a University of Pennsylvania or Wharton. The, there are, they are different schools altogether. You have to find out how each of these schools fit into your profiles or how each of these schools fit into your aspirations. Look at, the ki look at their websites. Look at the kind of students they admitted last year. Look at the kind of profiles they have admitted so far. And you would get an idea whether you fit into the profile of the class or not. Prepare your application. It is very, very important that you devote a lot of time to your essays and your LORs. Each of a school's application will take you anywhere from one to two months to write because of the kind of work they require. Then, of course, submitting your application on time. It's very important that you keep ahead of the deadlines and do not miss any of the deadlines which you have, you know, which you have ascertained that this is a school I'm going to apply for. Please apply early. Your financial aid depends on when you apply. The earlier you apply, the better your chances of financial aid. This is a typical timeline of, um, of going ahead and planning your entire application. As you can see, um, March to September should be utilized. Take your test, whether it is SAT, TOEFL, everything. Starting May to October, you have to start looking at the kind of you would be applying. Start shortlisting your schools along with preparing tests. It's very, very important. Each of these tests, at the time of taking these tests, you can send your score reports free of cost to any of the schools you will make use of that. But the February is utilized or should be completing and sending your application. Once you apply to each of these schools, the deadlines falls anywhere from October. The first round start from October, go on till November. Second round start from January and moving on to February. So please make sure that you have decided beforehand in which direction to apply. The decisions come from March to June. Once you have permission offer, start preparations and then of course prepare to go abroad. As you can see in this table, it is an eight to nine month process. So you have to do all the work and you have to be ready to put in a lot of effort. These are the stages which are covered in an admission. As soon as you submit an application, the first level says that your screening will happen to check whether 
the application you have submitted is complete or not, whether you have submitted all the required documents as asked by the university. Second level is once they the school has you have submitted a complete application, the admission committee starts. Once the admissions committee has looked at your application, they will proceed towards interview calls in programs like MBA and PhD and in undergrad in some cases. Once they have ascertained after speaking to you that you are the right fit for their school, they move on to give you either admission offers or rejecting your application. Now, there are a lot of myths about study abroad which are going to and fro and I thought that I should really really cover some of these study abroad myths and I sh and whether I will be able to address each of these myths for you. Um, you can't get financial aid to study abroad and studying abroad is expensive. Yes, study abroad is expensive but it really depends on the kind of country and the kind of program you go to. As far as financial aid is concerned, as I shared in my slides, there are a lot of scholarships, a lot of financial aid options which are open to you. As I mentioned, Credula. Credula is one of the organizations which gives you uh, more loan and the loan is processed faster than any other bank for that matter. So there are so many financial institutions which have come up which are ready to help any Indian student who's willing to go abroad and study. Take the decision. The application process to study abroad is difficult. Yes, it is. But it only takes a little effort to make it easy. It is not very difficult. As long as you have the right motivation and the right you can really, really put together a very, very good application. Take help from whosoever people you feel like. Please make sure that you give your 100% to your application process. And in my viewpoint, it is not difficult at all. The way it just takes from whatever you have done till now, your academic records, your essays which talk about your whatever you've done till now, and the letters of reference from people who know you. I have to study in an English-speaking country because I don't know any foreign languages. No, of course not. Every year. Thousands and thousands of students are going to countries like France, Germany, Spain. None of them know their, their languages. Of course, if you do know to a level, it is beneficial for you. But none of these countries or none of these schools insist that you have to understand their language. As long as you understand English, because almost all their programs are in English, you are very fit to go. You have to have very good grades to be accepted into a school or a study abroad program. As I covered in my earlier uh, information in my slides, that being a topper is definitely a very, very good thing. But very, very good grades is definitely a plus point. But even if you don't, and if just, just having a consistent performance is all what the university is looking at. You have to maintain your performance. Your performance should be going up every year. That is what is important. Studying abroad is not safe. Now, um, nothing, nowhere is safe. In fact, for India also for that matter. Every day you read some or the other instance. And you wouldn't believe if I say that studying abroad is as safe as it can get. Some universities like Virginia, Virginia Technological University, which is commonly referred to as Virginia Tech, has its own police force so that it can keep its, its international students, its domestic students, its students on its campus safe. So I really don't think anything can be more studying abroad. And just to summarize, um, apart from apart from job opportunities and compensation, on the lighter side, there are a lot of, lot of qualitative things which you can gain from study abroad. You can explore the world. You can immerse yourself in a new culture. You gain independence. You gain confidence. You interact with different nationalities. You develop an appreciation for other people coming from different nationalities, from different cultures, speaking different languages. And of course, you make new friends. 
So studying abroad is is an adventure in itself and I am sure through that adventure you are definitely definitely going to learn and um, I really really hope that my webinar was of um, as much information to you as you would have wanted to know about studying abroad and I would like to thank each one of you for attending this webinar and hope you gained something out of this. I would be open to questions now. Um, please type your questions in the questions box and I would be able to answer them. Thank you. Um, Park HP has asked me a question whether it is important to give DAD for BTEC in Germany. Um, I would like to tell you that um, DAD is not exactly a test. DAD is an organization which um, which is basically an organization for higher education in Germany. It is an association or an organization which scholarship programs which has a lot of scholarship programs for students who are wishing to go to Germany and study. Dad also has information on the kind of universities which are there in Germany. Of course if you are, if you intend to go for an undergraduate degree in Germany um, you would be going for a four-year four-year program. So please think about whether you would want to go for a four-year four-year continuous degree right or, or would you would like to opt for a three-year degree and then only decide please feel free to go through the DAD's website they have a lot of information they give you a lot of information about the universities as well um, Arun here has asked me a question um, with regards to the universities he's gotten admit from. Um, Arun, I think I would take your question a little later because this involves um, going into greater details. Uh, I hope you wouldn't mind that. Um, another question has been asked by Dinesh. Um, Dinesh has asked me for MS in cybersecurity. Is it not recommended to study at universities in Washington DC as the job offers are limited only to federal jobs? Well, I'm a little surprised where you got this information from because no matter which location you do, each of these lists of different kinds of placements for each of their programs. And cybersecurity being a very, very specialized, I'm sure they have a lot more placement opportunities and not just federal jobs. Of course, this area of study is, is very, very um, sensitive and technical. So, of course, people who do get jobs might prefer federal jobs to any other jobs. But that really, really doesn't mean that you cannot get any other jobs other than federal jobs. Please do not. Please do not think like that. Um, Callens has asked me a question. Is there a difference between fall and spring intake in the U.S. with respect to scholarship? A very, very good question, um, Callens. And definitely, definitely there is a very, very big difference. Um, fall intake in the U.S. is much more prevalent and you would get a lot more options in terms of scholarships as well as schools. 
spring intake is very very limited in United States so if you're really looking at study abroad programs in the US I would definitely suggest you to go for fall scholarship chances are very very limited in the spring intake um, any other questions which anybody would like to um, there is another question which has been asked by um, Balachandar and Balachandar has asked me about a distance mode. Um, Balachandar, uh, distance mode um, is uh, or I would say online learning is uh, much more uh, prevalent in the United States and um, I would really suggest to you that instead of going for an online learning where you would be spending as much amount of money and as much amount of time, you should really look at um, studying a full-time program because online courses even though um, all these universities give you a lot of material and you would be having uh, you know classes just like virtual learning but still the scope and the exposure which you will get by going there and studying would definitely you would not get through a distance learning or an online program. Any other questions if anybody else would like to ask me? which I can address for you. Um, there's another question which Kailash has asked me. Um, Kailash, I would, I would, I, I would like to talk to you uh, uh, separately because this this involves a lot of um, uh, details. So um, I, I hope you wouldn't mind. Um, uh, Rahul has uh, again asked me, a, which says, can you please provide some information about the universities in, for example, Japan, China, and South Korea, as these universities have great programs. Um, Rahul, uh, the thing is that yes, Asia Pacific has really, really picked up in terms of education abroad, but there are certain countries like Japan, like South Korea, where um, we still do face certain hurdles because of the importance which is given to their local language over there. So um, invariably, you might find that if you do not know Japanese or you don't know Co uh, Korean, um, you might find uh, or you might have uh, problems in landing up a job after you have studied um, any program in any of these countries. So um, I wouldn't say that you shouldn't consider these co uh, these um, uh, countries, but yes, if you decide to go to these uh, countries, please be aware that you might find a very big language barrier. China, for that matter, China has really, really come up in uh, come up with their masters in business administration programs. There are a lot of lot of good schools which have come up. For example, SEEBS, which is one of the most renowned schools in China. China has really come up in postgraduate um, education and their programs in, in, are in English and they boast of really, really um, good placement. So yes, China is one which you can consider if you postgraduate education. Um, Callens has asked me another question. Is Masters in Public Health better than Masters in Health Administration considering a post-study job? Um, Callens, uh, uh, both of these programs uh, might uh, sound uh, similar to you, but these two programs are particularly different. Masters in Health Administration covers more of management-related courses than Masters in Public Health. Masters in Public Health is a more technical program 
will cover your uh, course basics whereas health administration covers more of uh, uh, more of your management related subjects also so if you're really looking at a managerial kind of a job and not very academic or not very research oriented or not very specialized then health administration definitely is a better choice um akansha has asked me a question should we appoint an academic counselor for helping us through the admission process for masters um akansha um i would say that um it is very important that you start looking at the kind of universities you would apply um while you have started preparing for your tests so i wouldn't say that this is the time period where you should uh, get yourself appointed an academic counselor in fact you could do it yourself also but if you think you really need the help of an academic counselor then as soon as you start preparing for your tests it becomes very very important that along with your tests you also get an idea what kind of schools you would be looking at because you may never know the kind of you know or the kind of country you might be targeting might not need that test and you might already be preparing for that test so i don't think there's any use of then preparing for that test if the country doesn't need now you could only get to know that if you have an academic counselor or you research about it yourself while you are preparing for the test any other um any other questions which i can uh, help you guys with um can you please go back um if uh, uh If you guys don't have any questions I I would definitely like to take your leave thank you I thank each one of you of your time um to attend this webinar and, um thank you very much and um um again I would like to thank Credula for giving me this opportunity and of course uh Manya Broad uh which both of them which conducted this um session any any other if i can take from you guys before before i um one last question which yashwant had asked me say for an mba in carnegie mellon step up school of business it will cost around 90 lakhs um um yashwant an mba um generally costs anywhere from um 25 to 40 lakhs per annum so um but uh, most of these universities do have aid programs and i am sure you can get some kind of aid whether from the university or outside institutions which give you know uh, which give um uh, aid to students who are willing to go and study abroad so yes um as far as the cost is concerned yes it might stretch up to 60 to 60 to 70 lakhs and definitely um uh yashwant had again asked me a question what is the time duration that will be provided in credula for repaying the loan uh yashwant for this question i would i would um i would like you to um go through the website of credula or call credula um um the staff at credula because they are very very helpful and they will definitely ask 
question for you. Position to then take a decision whether you would like to um, go ahead for that. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.